So I'm going to talk about Mockers Park as a case study of our work in Bat for the Brink. So this is Mockers Park, uh, bounded by the yellow line. Um, so it's uh, about 139 hectares in size and dates back as a park for 400 years or more. Um, it's basically a site of two halves. The northeastern half is fairly gently sloping or undulating with um, lots of open grown oak trees um, all set around this pool. And then the site quickly steepens uh, to the southwest and becomes more of a kind of natural wood pastury type woodland habitat, probably with a few more tree species, a greater diversity of tree species as you get up to slope with more field maples and um, horse chestnuts and things um, scattered in there. Um, and then over the boundary to the southwest we have Mockers Hillwood bounded by the red line. Uh, so this is a site owned by the Woodland Trust but managed by the same Natural England team as managed Mockers Park. So in terms of our target species at Mockers, we have the Barberstell bat and the Beckerstein's bat. We have Nocturnal bat and we have Oak polypore. We have the Mockers beetle on the left and we have the Western wood vase hoverfly on the right. And we have three species of lichens, Basidia and Compta, the sap groove lichen, and Lecanora quercicola, the oak rim lichen. And we have Lecanora sublevescens, the lemon tart lichen. Um, so one of the important things I think that we did was to look for synergies between the species. So an obvious one would be that most of these species require oak trees um, and oak trees that are allowed to survive to a good age with a kind of natural ageing process. Um, they all require continuity of conditions, so like a lot, basically a long history of, of similar conditions, a long history of trees on the site. Um, so that's, that's the combination of having the right trees present for a long period of time, but it's also about the kind of conditions around the tree and a lot of that is down to the grazing and browsing. Um, but of course that needs to be at the right level to allow for regeneration and nectar sources to persist or know whether that's through managing grazing levels or by protecting regeneration with um, cages or planting with cages. Um, then there are some specific synergies. Um, so this photo on the right here is habitat for the western wood vase hoverfly and myelepta potens, um, an old horse chestnut tree. It looks like it's probably a, an old pollard. Um, it's got a big uh, sort of crack in the trunk here, probably where a limb has come off in the past. Um, that fills with water, which creates the breathing conditions for the hoverfly. Um, and then this photo is habitat for the sap groove lichen, Basidia incompta. So again, it's another horse chestnut, um, and it's uh, another horse chestnut that's lost a limb and has a water filled hole um, up the trunk there and that uh, water filled hole over tops and you get this nutrient rich water running down the trunk and that green street you see just left of centre is the lichen Basidia incompta. So these two species basically share the same habitat or aspects of the same habitat so the hoverfly breeding in the in the wet um, crevices and cavities in the tree and the the lichen um, making use of where that water runs out down the trunk. Um, then we have some slightly more general um, uh, specifics, if that makes sense, uh, like nectar sources and then the kind of context of the site within the wider landscape. Um, so in terms of the issues on the site and what have we done, well, some knowledge about what's happening to the species, what's where, how many, that kind of thing is pretty crucial. So we've actually put quite a lot of effort into survey work. Um, this picture on the left here is the entomologist John Cooter up an access platform surveying for Mockers beetle earlier this year. Now John surveyed Mockers beetles in each year of the project so far, so we've got three years worth of information from those surveys. 
and on the right here is a team of lichenologists from the British Lichen Society. We had a two day survey event with 20 lichenologists on site, um, which gave us a really, really good thorough survey. Um, we found you know, a lot of new species for the site. We got a lot more information on um, where things like the Lechonora subnovescens is and how it's doing. Um, we found Lechonora quicker new to the site. Uh, we found a new species for Britain on the site, Rhinodyna exiguo, an ancient tree specialist. Um, so as well as the lichens and the Marcus beetle, we've surveyed for oak polypore. We've surveyed for the western wood vase hoverfly. And we've done some quite intensive work surveying for bats uh, using acoustic survey equipment. Um, and found uh, that we have up to six bat species on the site. Um, in terms of continuity, so um, on the left we have some pollarded trees. So these oaks were planted about 30 years ago. So not part of this project, but they were pollarded as part of the project. Um, Pollarding hasn't been used that extensively on the site in the past, but there are some old pollards present, but um, there is quite a distinct age gap in the tree generation. So pollarding is basically a way to um, to prematurely age a tree or, or at least to encourage a tree to develop veteran features at an earlier age. Um, so this is a way to try and reduce that sort of generation gap ever so slightly. Um, then we've also been planting trees, so uh, and this has largely been targeted at the the species that we've been focusing on at Marcus. So here's a horse chestnut tree planted. Um, hopefully, at some stage in the future, that will become habitat for uh, the lichen Basidia and Compta and the western wood vase hoverfly. So again, with continuity, so uh, this picture on the left here is um, a rock outcrop up the slope at Moccas um, with the lichen Gaelecta ulmi. So this lichen was a real elm specialist, but um, it's not known on trees anywhere in Britain now. Um, it's just known on rock outcrops, lime rich rock outcrops. Um, and Moccas is the only English site. Um, there's sites in the Scottish Highlands too. Um, but here at Moccas, um, it's doing pretty well actually, um, but it's, it's very light demanding and um, it's basically under threat from the hawthorn growing around and on the, the rock outcrops, which are creating quite a lot of shade. So we've done some um, light pruning of the uh, hawthorns just to um, remove that shade threat from the Galette Olmai. Um, in terms of the sort of long-term continuity of management, the site's grazed by its um, fallow, herd, fallow deer herd um, and also cattle and sheep. Um, so that kind of maintains the open conditions more long-term. I mean, I think there is a slight concern at Moccas around um, natural regeneration um, and, and maybe there's an argument for tweaking the grazing regime but you know a lot of sites don't have that grazing and browsing at all so um, you know that, that that's pretty fundamental in maintaining the open conditions long term on the site. Um, other work we've done is the planting of nectar sources um, so this picture on the left shows Five little blue dots where nectar sources have been planted. So some of the planting includes uh, hawthorn for the western wood vase hoverfly, uh, but also other species for you know more general uh, saprozylic invertebrates. Um, we've also undertaken training for arborists, um, but note that um, in this picture on the right here, they, they, you can see these flat cut ends to the branches now. That is not good practice for invertebrates, um, especially things like the moccas beetle, which require kind of more natural rot into those branch ends created through uh, sort of more natural fracturing of the branch ends, basically. So these flat cut ends to branches is something to be avoided. In fact, um, tree surgery on these veteran trees is to be avoided in general terms. Um, this is something we've been talking to Natural England about. Um, and they no longer 
undertake tree surgery on veteran trees um, unless there's a very good case to do so and and that case will generally be that the tree will be about to fall over and they'll they'll do some surgery to try and keep it upright but this kind of work that they used to do sort of tidying up old trees is, is a thing of the past now really so in terms of connectivity this is a real issue for a lot of the species that we're working on and you can see here in this picture how much of a kind of oasis really Mockers Park is within a slightly more improved um, agricultural landscape. Um, I mean there are some sort of parkland type trees extending to the northeast um, but generally uh, it's a relatively lightly treed landscape these days. Um, the area to the southwest of Mockers, so um, within the red boundary, as I mentioned earlier, is Mockers Hill Wood. So this is a site that's owned by the Woodland Trust, but managed by Natural England. Um, this is in the process, early stages of um, quite a big restoration project to restore what was formerly a, a large, large plantation to uh, a wood broadleaf wood pasture. Um, so the larch has been removed. Um, and Natural England have um, hatched a plan to uh, restore that to wood pasture. So thinking about what the wood pasture is going to look like, what species of tree to plant um, and where and at what density, all that kind of stuff. So very early stages, but that, um, when that's completed, that will massively extend the, the area of wood pasture habitat at Mockers. Um, and we're also, through the project in the early stages of discussions with some neighbouring landowners about potential further afield. I mean, looking to the east of the boundary here, you can kind of see how there are actually quite a few big trees still in hedgerows and sort of within a few fields, and there's quite a few little copses here and there. So you can start to see how, um, how you can start to create habitat with what you've got and more connectivity between woodland blocks um, so yeah as I say that's that's early stages uh, but we have just started working on that so to wrap up I think these are the real key messages so um, finding out what you've got where it is what it needs what's happening to it I think is pretty fundamental to then going on to make decisions about management I think looking for those synergies is really important and um, I think can be quite helpful so um, you know looking for synergies in the ecology of species the issues and the management that different species require I think can actually help simplify the task um, in many respects so instead of thinking oh, I've got you know 300 species of lichen on this site what am I going to do for them all um, thinking that you know, where they fall into two categories, one one that need uh, one group that needs oak trees, mature, well-lit oak trees, and another group that needs um, horse chestnuts with wounds, then that makes it a lot simpler. And similarly with the the uh, Basidia incompta and the Western Woodvars holofly, you know, two species from different tax groups that require more or less the same management. So I think that can help to simplify things a little. Um, Targeting specific management for the species that you have to the right places is pretty fundamental too. Um, so making sure that your uh, your new horse chestnut plantings, for example, are in and around the areas where the Basidia incompta and the Western Woodvars hoverfly are. Um, just keep an eye on that long-term management and making sure that that long-term beneficial management is in place. So whether that's um, a long-term plan for tree planting and tree surgery such as we've just talked about or uh, the grazing so the grazing and browsing um, that's fundamental too and then of course thinking about the site in the context of the wider landscape and um, you know just how it interacts with that wider landscape so um, looking for opportunities to uh, buffer the site essentially um, and also perhaps thinking about what the site can offer in terms of things that are beyond the site boundary. Um, yeah, so, uh, so that's me. Thank you very much for listening.